you are no longer strangers or wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You are no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. checked my phone. <laughs> She's getting faster. <laughs> I checked my phone during first service, and I never do that, but I checked it because my daughter was flying, and I wanted to know where she was. I wanted to know if she went to a party for her friend. She's in her wedding in September, and um, they, they did a bachelorette party last night in Chicago, and my daughter's pregnant, so I knew she was being a good girl and didn't get in any trouble, you know, but uh, uh, I wanted, this morning she was flying out of the big city airport, and so I checked my phone because I wanted to know where she was, and I could know where she was, so we have all of our GPS devices, and we can check on one another, and if I'm lost, I can find where I am. The question is, where do we belong. We know where we are, but where do we belong? And in this study of Ephesians, that's what we're addressing. Where do we belong? And Paul is writing to the Ephesians, uh, this small, tiny church, and then they passed it to other churches, small, tiny churches, beginner churches that had just been planted and who were growing and growing, and sometimes kind of awkwardly growing and learning things, but he wrote this to them so that they could get it clear what they knew about where they belonged and how they came to belong there. So a God who has all the hairs on our number, the numbers uh, the hairs on our head numbered, and the God who knows when any sparrow falls, Jesus tells us, that God wants us to know where then that, the fact that we do, we uh, do belong. So we are here, we belong here, and we learned last week that that's because God made the decision way before he created the earth that we were all to be adopted. None of us have the right to be in this family, but we have been adopted to be part of the family of God. And then in belonging, the, adopt, the adoptees, us, become the adopters. That was the big idea for last week. So this week we're talking about aliens. <laughs> so much talk about aliens lately because we're releasing videos of things flying faster than we think they could fly and moving in ways they didn't think they could move. We talk about aliens, but these aliens are, as, as I talked about last week, everybody in Ephesus. When Paul set foot in Ephesus, there was absolutely no one who had ever heard this wonderful story of Jesus sent from God, of Jesus born and who taught and who lived and who was crucified, dead, and buried, and then he wasn't. I love that when uh, uh, I, taught, I taught some little kids one, I can't remember why, I taught some little kids one uh, uh, Sunday, and it was Easter, so I was teaching them, here's the basics, guys. The cross is empty. It's Easter morning, right? The cross is empty, and they all went, the cross is empty, right? The tomb is empty, and they all said, yep, the tomb is empty. And then I said, and Jesus, and they see me, Jesus is on the loose. Yep, the cross is empty, the tomb is empty, and Jesus is on the loose. We said it over and over and over. And then when Sunday school was over and they went to their parents, they said, guess what? <laughs> The cross is empty, the tomb is empty, and Jesus is on the loose. Where here in Ephesians, when Paul's writing this letter, these churches had been planted and they were growing, kind of awkwardly were growing, and Jesus is on the loose. And Jesus is on the loose in a place called the Roman Empire. Ephesus, part of the Roman Empire. And how'd that come to happen? Well, let me arrogantly sum up the whole Old Testament for you, okay? <laughs> Don't try this at home, right? 
kind of arrogant to think I can do it. But here's the truth of the Old Testament. The Old Testament tells us that God's first deal with the Jewish people was, here's the deal, I'll be your God and you be my people. And don't try to be, you don't try to be God and I won't try to act like a people. Because you know what? All of the places, all those places in Ephesus that I walked by when I was there were temples to Artemis and this God and that God. And that. You know what those gods acted like? People. And Paul in this scripture said that, you know what? When we're like people, we want to do what we want when we want. That's basically us, the source of our sin. We want to do what we want when we want. Sounds like a toddler or a teenager or me sometimes, right? So God said, I'll be the God and you be my people. This will work. But we all know it didn't work very well, and God had to get a little more specific about what that meant. So eventually through Moses, via a burning bush, he gave the Ten Commandments. Just Ten Commandments. And we all know that people, even before they had the commandments, were breaking the commandments. They continued to do so, and it didn't work, even though God said just 10. And so they started to have laws, to add laws, and they called it building a fence around the Ten Commandments. And they built a, fe a fence that included more and more laws about how to keep the Ten Commandments. Then they had to build another fence around more laws that's a, about how to, how to keep the Ten Commandments because people kind of kept going, well, 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 what if... And what if, so they had laws, and you can go back through the Old Testament and fall asleep very easily from trying to read all of that law. You couldn't follow it because you couldn't even know it all, right? And so since people were still being people and not God's people, God sent prophets one by one by one. People who spoke, not about the future, but just spoke the words that God wanted people to know. God speaking in human words through these prophets, and we all know that they did a couple things. Sometimes they listened to the prophets, and sometimes they killed the prophets. God sent judges to help people keep these laws so that he could be their God, and they would be his people and stop trying to be God all the time. And, and uh, uh, that didn't work either. And then they all said, they all got together and had a massive protest and said, we want a king. We want a king. Give us a king. And Samuel the prophet said, trust me, you don't want a king. I'm talking for God here. <laughs> you don't want a king. That's not going to work out well. But the people said, no, we want a king. And so you remember the first king God gave them was... Saul, who turned out to be pretty crackers, and that whole experience of having a king didn't start out well. And then sometimes it did, David, Solomon, other times it was a disaster, absolute disaster. And all the time God's going, all I really wanted was to be your God and for you to be my people. And it looks like instead... I'm going to have to come and be a people. And in Jesus Christ, who came across the universe from the presence of God to be born one of us, God became people. But he wasn't a normal people, Jesus wasn't, because he wasn't all about, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. He didn't go join a rock band or anything like that as a young man. Jesus came as a people to walk with us and talk with us. That's why I love to read the Gospels, to see more and more, get a vision of what Jesus was like as he walked with us and talked with us. And God said, I'll become a people to prove to you that you need me to be your God. You need me to be your God. And you can do, I mean, people had done some very offensive things to God. They had worshipped other idols, and they had just absolutely killed the prophets, and they had rebelled against the kings, and the people did not do well at being God's people. And he said, he said, you can do your worst now. Here is my son. Do your very worst, 
and they did. In a cooperation between the Romans and the Jews, they killed God's only son. And God said, do your worst, and they did. And he said, if you do your worst, I'll still forgive you, and I'll still love you. Do your worst. And what did Jesus say from the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And God did. Forgive us. And his offer is still, I'll be your God. And you can be my people. He restored us permanently to being his people. And what Paul's telling us and the people in Ephesus who are aliens... When he walked in there, nobody knew the story. Nobody knew about Jesus. And by the time he's writing this letter, there's a church there, a fledgling church there, and churches all around there that had been started. And Paul in this letter is explaining that Jesus was not just for the Jews, because all that Old Testament I'm talking about just applied to the Jews. But now Jesus is not just for the Jews. And God has knocked down the wall that separated Jews and not Jews. And not Jews are Gentiles, and every one of us, as far as I know, is a Gentile, not Jews. But we're included in one big adopted family. So here's the scripture in the message version just to help us understand it a little bit more. He's been telling them all this that I just told you, and then uh, Paul writes, don't take any of that for granted. It was only yesterday that you outsiders to God's ways had no idea of any of this. Yeah. Didn't know the first thing about the way God works. Hadn't the faintest idea of Christ. You knew nothing of that rich history of God's covenants and promises in Israel. Hadn't a clue about what God was doing in the world at large. And now because of Christ dying that death, shedding that blood, you were once out of it altogether but are in on everything. The Messiah has made things up between us. I'm talking about Jews and Gentiles. He's made things up between us so that we are now together on this. Both non-Jewish outsiders and Jewish insiders. He tore down the wall. He tore down the wall we used to keep each other at a distance. And that was good news, especially for all those who'd been kept throughout the history of God working With the Jewish people, they'd been kept on the outs, and now they were in because the the wall had been broken down. So the big idea today is God reconciles divided peoples in a politically subversive act. And the politically subversive act that Paul is talking about here is when he said to these people who live in the Roman Empire, he said, Christ is is our peace. That just sounds like something you say to each other, right, when you shake hands and go, peace of Christ, peace of Christ, Christ is our peace, you know. But it was a subversive, crazy thing to say at this time and in this place. Take a look at the, this time Paul's writing, the map of the uh, Roman Empire. Man, they had made it far and near, but all of that, that is color, was the Roman Empire. To them, they had conquered the world, the world as they knew it. Now, we know there's a whole lot of world, more world there, but as far as the Roman Empire, Empire was concerned, they had conquered everybody that they could conquer. And so they hit this point after like a 200-year uh, time span, span of being at war and conquering these people and that people and these people, and they had conquered uh, Israel and uh, the, in the time of Jesus They were occupied by Rome, Roman soldiers, Roman um, uh, leaders had taken over there. But Rome had a problem also at this time. Caesar Augustus, yeah, that's Caesar Augustus, um, uh, entered this period of what they call the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. That's all the Roman Empire. 
So there was then this 200 year time span of the Roman Empire that they called the golden age of imperialism. Order, prosperity, stability, and some expansion went on during that time. But basically they weren't constantly at war with the world trying to bring everybody under the, the um, administration of the Roman Empire. And it lasted from about 27 BC before Christ's birth um, until 180, 180 years after Christ's birth. And there were like five good em emperors during that time. So there was a period of approximately two centuries that the Roman people had to be convinced that it was okay to have peace, the Pax Romana. The Roman... Um, I'm fascinated with this stuff, you might be able to tell. The Roman Empire was about 70 million people in it by that time. And it f kept uh, peace, other than just little here and there um, kind of uh, uh, rebellions, until about uh, the third century. So the Pax Romana was about... Caesar Augustus, yeah, that's Caesar Augustus from my Bible, had the problem that he couldn't send his legions out to conquer anybody. Now, they watched over the whole empire, but he, he wasn't conquering anybody. He wasn't taking their, their riches. He wasn't bringing in back slaves or anything like that. And he had to convince people that for the Roman Empire that had a reputation in their own minds of being great military conquerors, he had to convince them that peace was okay. And so he used a propaganda um, program to convince people that Pax Romana was a good thing. He made a big deal of ceremony of closing the gates of Janus, which was a temple uh, of a god that looked forward. He had two faces, one looking forward, one looking back. And it was always open when they were at war. And they made a big deal of closing the gates, saying, Whew, peace. And people were like... Peace. We don't know how to do peace. And so they, the, the term Pax Romana became very, very popular. They put it out on their money. Here's one example of a coin that is from Caesar Augustus on one side, and the other side says Pax Augustus. He was the first one, so sometimes it says Pax Augustus. And they enjoyed prosperity, and little by little, took you know generations, but little by little, the Romans became okay, even felt it was normal to have peace. Paul came along during that time and wrote to the Ephesians that went to a lot of churches. He wrote, Christ is our peace. Caesar, no. Remember when they were getting ready to crucify Christ, what the people yelled? Is this your king, they asked? He said, we have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. That was about living in Rome and in, under the Pax Romana. So this is a controversial thing to say when Paul said, our peace is, is Christ. Our peace is Christ. Christ is our peace. So it was about 70 AD, and Christ had predicted it, that there was an uprising in Israel. And Jesus had stood one day, and when he was with us, those few years that he preached, he had stood there one day, and everybody was looking at the temple in Jerusalem that is not there now. They were looking at the temple, and they were going, ah, oh, took so long to build it, most fantastic building ever built. God should be so pleased with us because of it. And they were just looking at it. And Jesus commented and says it in Luke 21, 5. All of this that you're admiring so much will end up in a heap of rubble. It will end up in a heap of rubble. 70 AD, one generation, 40 years after the death of Christ, the Romans came in and said, we aren't messing with you people anymore with your worship of this one true God that you say, and no worship of Caesar. And so they came in and they leveled the temple and it became a heap of rubble other than the one wall that still stands today, one wall. 
one wall. Christ is our peace. And during that time, it's interesting because in Israel, the temple went, but also Paul and the other disciples and many apostles were traveling all over that Roman Empire, all around the Mediterranean basin. They're traveling all over, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ. And how were they doing that? On Roman roads. <laughs> Roman roads that had been built to move their legions to pillage and burn and steal and capture people. Those Roman roads, Paul and all the others traveled to all these places and told the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, what's that got to do with any of it? I love the history of it, but what's it got to do with any of it? All that just to tell you, here's why Paul saying Christ is our peace was a big deal in this letter. Well, America, where we live, is just a baby country compared to the Roman Empire. Just a baby country, and it's an exper experiment in democracy that's sometimes just gone really well and sometimes not so well. Um, but we've been a country for 245 years now. And of that 245 years, 227 of those years, all but just a handful. 227 of those years, we have been at war of some kind, of some level, or not peace. And today, in the day we live, is still a terrible time of conflict. And mostly it was far away, but lately it's been right among us. And it's really, really scary, and it's getting scarier. My daughter had to fly. She had been in a pandemic after having a baby, so she's been home with the baby. She hadn't flown anywhere. She had barely gone anywhere. Finn didn't know what a grocery store was till a month ago, and he went, wow, this is fun, you know. But she hasn't been doing anything, and she has kind of some anxiety issues anyway. So going on this little trip, an hour flight up there, two days of partying, and flying back this morning was just she called me crying. She was just so anxious about it. And here's one reason she's so anxious about it. YouTube videos. She said, people are crazy on airplanes. So you're, you're, you're stuck in this flying tube of toothpaste, right? With all these other people. And there's a lot of people flying now. And she sees on YouTube videos people who are, some of them intoxicated, some of them just cranky. Some of them who uh, uh, are fighting over seats. Some of whom don't want to wear their mask. And please, we need them to wear their mask on an airplane. So I have to breathe their air. So she's watching all these videos of people fussing and cussing and carrying on and disrupting everybody. And of course, everybody has their phone on taping this. So they put it on YouTube. And then eventually, uh, we see the poor crew who should get hazard pay right now. The crew of the airplane has to deal with the person, and the person won't give up and won't give in. And so they call the police, and the police come, and they zip tie them or something. And they sometimes have to drag them to the ground, and they have to drag them out of the airplane. And then you know what the other people on the airplane do, right? <laughs> Goodbye. Kristen didn't want to fly, because <laughs> she'd seen too much of that, too much of that. Well, this is the world my grandson's been being raised in now, where his mother's crying because she has to fly somewhere. And I don't like it. I don't like it. So wouldn't you think that my neighbors and your neighbors would be ready for some good news, some good news like, hey, the cross was empty. The tomb is empty, and Jesus is on the loose. And the Republicans aren't our peace. And the Democrats aren't our peace. And the Supreme Court isn't our peace. And dividing us up is not going to bring peace. Jesus, Paul said, here's a shocking idea, friends, neighbors. Jesus is our peace. So what's our next step? Here's the way I said it. Christ followers, 
take down that wall. Jesus has already taken the wall down between me and my neighbors that are Korean or Indian or Senegalese. Jesus has taken down the walls and we're brothers and sisters. And so take down whatever walls you find. God has talked to us about being being hospitable and we try really hard here at our church. And he's talked to us about inclusion and we try really hard. to be. You know, I I was uh, a couple years ago, our bishop... Um, Bishop Julius Trimble, they give bishops certain jobs, and the one that he opted for was to become the head of the um, Global AIDS Fund. And so in Indianapolis, we had a great gathering of people from all over the world. Ryan White's mother was there. Remember Ryan White? His mother was there and blessed us so much with her testimony. But she also told us how mean a community and the good Christian people and the church how they, when Ryan was sick, they basically had to move because of how mean they were. Deborah Burks, the doctor, <laughs> uh, the doctor who worked for the government during the pandemic, she was there to talk about world health and the AIDS epidemic. So we were there for two days and we prayed and we talked and I learned a bunch of stuff and I met so many uh, amazing people because people with AIDS are getting old and they're dying of natural causes or other things now. Isn't that wonderful? But I met a lot of people and I promised myself, I promised myself that the first thing I would do when I got back to Columbus because somebody said, do you even know who the people living with AIDS are in your community? Do you know, even know who they are? And I sat there and I felt sick because I said, not one. I don't know who's living with AIDS in my community. And I'm hearing testimonies from all these people who are talking about it's torture to live with AIDS. Socially, physically, it's torture. And they said, do you know who they are in your community? I said, nope. And I promised myself that the first thing I did when I got back to Columbus was figure out a way to find out in our community who were the people living with AIDS. And I didn't do it. And now I'm retired. And now the pandemic is, I'm scared to say over, (laughs) better. And I'm going to keep that promise to myself now because there's a wall there. They tell us there's a wall there, people living with AIDS, between us and them. I'm going to find out who they are and break down that wall. That's what we're called to do. When you pray to God, God will give you a vision for something like that. Not that, but you'll find out what walls need to be broken down. Next step, take down that wall that God reveals to you.